Okay, so once again, now we're going to do a another one tail test on a single population mean. So this exercise is very, very similar to our first exercise that we did in 9.1a. So let's just jump right into this problem and then we'll talk about each of the steps as we go through. So here we have an instructor at the TRU School of Business and Economics who has produced a series of problems and accompanying video walkthroughs in hopes of improving his statistics students' understanding of course content. Boy, this sure sounds familiar to me. Having taught this course many times, he determines the historical average is 76%. The population standard deviation is found to be 17.3%. At the end of the following semester, he has a class of 45 students who had access to the video walkthroughs. They had an average grade of 81.3%. Using our level of significance of 0 0.05, we're going to determine a uh, test to determine whether or not this shows an improvement. So, first thing that I like to do in any type of problem when we've got a whole bunch of writing and a bunch of numbers scattered throughout is I like to take note of or highlight what's important in this problem because sometimes it can be a little bit overwhelming when you're looking at a problem and you see there's a whole bunch of information here it can be a little bit overwhelming to know what is relevant and what is not relevant. One of the things that I sometimes do, and I know this sounds mean, is sometimes I'll intentionally put useless information into a problem just to make sure that students gain the ability and can demonstrate the ability to ignore something that is useless. So let's go through here. Um, I've ta taught the course many times. There's a historical average of 76, standard deviation of 17.3, I've got a sample size here of 45 and a sample mean of 81.3. This level of significance, again, this is telling us our comfort level with committing a type one error. The, the, the exposure, or I should really just stick to saying our comfort level with rejecting a true null hypothesis. So being led to believe the alternative when in fact the null may be true. And again, we don't ever know if we've committed a type 1 error, but we can simply control our exposure to it. So test to determine whether or not this shows an improvement over the historical average. So that's telling me the type of test that I want to put together. Once again here, this is saying it's a one tail test. On an exam or on most assignments, you probably don't have that level of detail telling you what to do. So again, the, the first challenge that students tend to face, what the heck kind of test am I supposed to do here? Is this a lower tail test, an upper tail test? Is it a two tail test? And that can often be challenging. And so you need to look for these little clues that, that guides you um, towards what type of test. And here, this is my clue. I'm looking to see if I have evidence to show an improvement. We're talking about grades. I want to see, do I have evidence to show that the grade is higher than what it has been? And here's what it has been. So that helps me formulate my test. I have my null and my alternative, and I want to see, do I have evidence to show that the grade is now greater than that historical average? So my alternative says, yes, it is greater than the historical average. The null, very pessimistic, the null is no, it is not greater than that historical average. So there's how I would formulate this test. Now, to justify that formulation, I would simply say, you know, I formulated it this way because if the evidence, so when we go through all of this, these calculations and we get our p-value and critical value, if our evidence supports the null hypotheses, well, then I am unable to show that we have uh, improved or that student, improve, uh, student performance has improved.
if the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses. Okay, now I have evidence to show an improvement over that historical average. So again, the alternative hypotheses demonstrates a improvement. Yes, we have improved. The null, no, no evidence of any improvement. Okay, so now we want to calculate our test statistics. So again, just to go through this, and so you can really see what it is we're doing, right? Remember, we always perform our tests under the assumption, let me make this clear, that we're talking about an assumption. We assume HO is true, and again, we assume it's true with equality, Part of the reason that equality is always in the null hypotheses. So here's my assumed distribution. Now from the actual population is where we draw our sample. And so there I have this sample of 81.3. So that sample, it came from the population. Did it come from our assumed population? In other words, what is the likelihood, what is the probability of obtaining a sample with a mean of 81.3 from a distribution that has a mean of 76? Well, to know what is the likelihood, what is the probability of getting that sample from our assumed distribution, well, now we need to standardize that or normalize it. So now I can look at the Z distribution, right? So here I have that formula. Again, I don't ever expect my students to memorize formulas or know how to derive formulas. That's not the point. So if we standardize this so that I know where that lies in my standard normal distribution, now I can get that probability. So let's go through the calculations. My sample mean is 81.3. My hypothesized value is 76. My standard deviation is here, 17.3. Over the square root of, here's my sample size, 45. If I pull up my little calculator, this is going to be 81.3 minus 76 divided by 17.3 over root 45. And so that gives me a test statistic of 2.05. We can round it and say 2.06. So here that's going to be 2.06. So here's my test statistic is up here, 2.06. Now, what's the probability associated with that? What is the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as unlikely as the one that we have just obtained? We're going to use both the p-value approach and the critical value approach, which again are perfectly redundant. We will always get the same conclusion. One of the nice things about doing it both ways, not only do you get the practice of using these distribution tables, which can be a little bit tedious to use, and if you're not really comfortable using them, sometimes you can run out of time on an exam if you're fumbling around with these tables. So it's nice to get practice using them, but also, because it's perfectly redundant, meaning you would always get the same conclusion using the p-value approach and the critical value approach, Using them both is actually kind of a double check so that you go through, you do both approaches. If you find that you get a different conclusion between those two approaches, guaranteed it's because you screwed up somewhere. And then you can go back and you can hopefully find out where you've made that mistake. So again, you know, once you get practice and you get confident, generally speaking, the p-value approach is by far the one that is most common. But for the sake of practice, because we're students, we're practicing this, we'll always use both approaches. So uh, p-value approach. So what I want here, this is an upper tail test. 
the probability that I'm interested in is that upper tail. So, okay, I have my test statistic of 2.06. So if I scroll down to my Z tables, I can see, okay, these are negative values. So I'm going to go with my test statistics positive. So I'm going to come down here and I have a test statistic of 2.0. And where's my 6? Here's that 0 0.06 here. So if I follow this down to here, well, that gives me this value 0.98. Well, that doesn't seem right. And this, again, is a really common mistake that I see from my students, is you look up exactly your test statistic, you see this is the probability that corresponds with that test statistic. Well, then it's easy to think, okay, well, then, you know, I did what I'm supposed to do. I looked up that test statistic, and I have a probability of... 0 0.98 and now my instructor told me that the p-value is the probability that corresponds with my test statistic so that must be it. Be very very careful because again when we look at these tables and different publishers different instructors will often have different tables and so you have to be very careful how those tables are constructed. Probably the most common for the Z tables is to be given a lower tail probability. And here I can see that's a lower tail probability. So when I look at my distribution, and I do encourage my students to get into the habit of drawing it just as I'm drawing it here. Again, not because you have to, but because it's good practice and it helps you kind of see what's going on. It helps you visualize the problem a little bit more. Because hopefully we all remember that the area under this curve of the normal distribution is equal to 1. And so I get a p-value here of 0.98 and I'm doing an upper tail test. Well, that doesn't look right. How can that little tail, that little piece in the upper tail, how can that possibly be equal to 0.98 if the whole area is equal to 1? So again, drawing it out, looking at it visually, it's a little bit easier to kind of see what you're doing and to maybe catch mistakes. So if those tables are giving us lower tail probabilities, well then what that means, oops, is that this area here, let me find my pen again, this area here is equal to 0.98. That's not my p-value. Again, this is an upper tail test. My p-value must come from the upper tail. So if the area under that curve is equal to 1, well, then this area is going to be 1 minus 0.98, which is 0 0.02. So there I can see my p-value is, in fact, 0 0.02. Now, there's even a faster way to get that p-value. And again, it's a bit of a shortcut. I don't always recommend shortcuts until students are really comfortable with the distributions and are really comfortable with what they're doing. But these distributions are perfectly symmetric. So if I fold it in half along that zero line, both sides of this distribution are identical. Which means that if I say, okay, what if I look up negative 0.06 because I know my distribution is giving me lower tail probabilities. My tables are giving me lower tail probabilities. If I look up negative 206, well, this probability is going to be exactly the same as the one that I actually want. So if I come down to my tables and I look up negative. 
Well, there I get exactly that probability that I want. I have my p-value, again, I can round this up to 0 0.02, which is exactly what we got the other way as well. But taking advantage of that symmetry, it eliminates this one step maybe makes it a little bit faster, especially if you're in an exam situation. So we have our p-value here is 0 0.02. Now before we draw our conclusion with the p-value approach, why don't we get into the critical value approach as well. So again, we're going to start now with that level of significance, 0.05. And I'm going to look this up in the table. And again, here we need to be comfortable with the symmetry. Because again, I know I'm doing an upper tail test. Which means that my rejection space, which is defined by that critical value, my rejection space, let me just clean up all this mess. My rejection space must be in the upper tail. Again, because I'm doing an upper tail test, my rejection region is in the upper tail, which means that my critical value must be positive. Well, if I go down and I look for in that upper tail, I'm looking at the positive values, and I'm trying to find 0 0.05 in here, it doesn't exist. Right? It's, it's nowhere to be found. Again, because these are giving us lower tail probabilities. I would want to look up 1 minus alpha, which is here 0.95, because if I have an area of 0.95 in that lower tail, that gives me an area of alpha 0 0.05 in the upper tail. And I can do that, and I can see, you know, okay, 0.95 is right between these two. So that's 1.6. And really, I'm exactly between those two values. So if I come up here to my second decimal, again, my value that I want for my second decimal is right between here. So that gives me a Z of 0 0.05 of 1.645. 1 1.6, 1 and then 4.5 because the, the value that I want is exactly between those two. So that's fine, that works. But it's, re it's reliant on us remembering to do this, that to, to convert to a lower tail probability. If I just remember that these distribution tables are perfectly symmetric, well, maybe it's easier to look here, because now I'm looking for just alpha. I'm not trying to convert it to one minus alpha. And again, I can see that my alpha, 0 0.05, is right in between here. There's 1.6. There's 4. There's 5. So this gives me, in fact, negative 1.645. But this distribution is perfectly symmetric. And so because it's perfectly symmetric, if I have a value of negative 1.645 in the lower tail, if that's the value that corresponds with 0 0.05 in the lower tail, well then that's the value here that corresponds with 0 0.05 in the upper tail. I didn't draw those exactly to scale, but that's okay. So there's that critical value, Z for 0.05. That again defines my rejection space. If my test statistic is greater than or equal to that critical value, we will reject. If it's less than that, we will not reject. And again, I can see how it's perfectly redundant with the p-value approach. Because here, this green shaded area is equal to my level of significance, 0 
I can see that my test statistic is larger than that value. And as a result, the p-value, which is the area there in that upper tail, is smaller, right? The red area is smaller than the green area. My p-value is smaller than alpha when my test statistic in this upper tail test is greater than the critical value. So in using both approaches, we have evidence to reject the null hypotheses. Our evidence supports the alternative. Again, why are we rejecting? Not just because the p-value is less than alpha. We're rejecting because it's possible that my sample came from this distribution. It's certainly it's not impossible. It is possible that my null is true. It is possible that if my null is true that I draw a sample from that population with a mean of 81.3. But what this number is telling me is that it's really unlikely. The likelihood of drawing a sample like this one from this distribution, it's pretty unlikely. That probability is quite small. And because it is sufficiently small, in other words, it's smaller than my level of significance, I will say it's sufficiently unlikely that it came from that distribution. And so that supports the alternative hypotheses. So finally, my conclusion here, of course, we have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypotheses which means we have evidence to show that those students who had access to the video walkthroughs did in fact show an improvement in their performance over the historical average. Now again, when I am teaching this course, often my students struggle with the very first step, which is formulating that test. Formulating that test requires a really good understanding of the problem and what is it you're supposed to be testing. Once you've got that figured out, well then we're throwing numbers in a formula, we're pressing buttons on our calculator and looking at these distribution tables and you know that takes a little bit of practice but generally those aren't the hard parts. Formulating the test is often a hard part and then figuring out, what does that mean? Okay, so I rejected the null hypothesis. Now what? So what? What does that tell me? So now we have to go back to the problem and interpret that conclusion in the context of this problem. And so we have to remind ourselves, of course, what the problem was and what was it that we were doing. And so here again, we rejected the null hypotheses. Our evidence supports the alternative, which means we do have evidence to show an improvement over the historical average. Okay, that's it for problem 9.1b. I hope this was very helpful, and uh, come back soon. We'll do the next problem 9.1c. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.